Maryland, and author of The Great New Orleans Kidnapping Case, Race, Law, and Justice in the Reconstruction Era. I want to thank the people from Oxford for coming this morning, particularly those of you who have been working on this book. The books are a massive undertaking. I appreciate what all you do. Uh, and I thought I'd just quickly open by kind of setting the scene of this story so maybe you can see what I saw as I was reading the newspapers from July and, and June, July of 1870 while I was doing other research and stumbled across this case that no one had ever written about before and said, oh, we can't let something I need to, to look at. Uh, June of 1870, a uh, white baby from an Irish immigrant family lived in a swampy part of New Orleans known as the back of town, which is right where the Superdome is located uh, today, uh, was abducted by two African-American women. And in a crime-filled city where murders, duels, and all kinds of violence were commonplace, even on the day of that event, the story suddenly is going to become front page news in New Orleans because the rumor begins to circulate that the baby has been abducted for use as a voodoo sacrifice. And the practitioners of voodoo after the Civil War, now able to practice their religion openly, were indeed having, in the weeks that followed, their St. John celebrations on Lake Pontchartrain, who was the Molly baby had been abducted for use as a sacrifice. So this gets into the newspapers, and people start reading about the case. But what makes this case become even more sensationalized is the context of time in the world. June of 1870 is the height of radical reconstruction, a moment after the Civil War, the federal government and uh, Republicans in the South, backed by federal bayonets, uh, were trying to bring a new social and political order to the South. You have African Americans serving in the state legislature, serving on juries, serving in government offices, and the New Orleans police force had just been integrated by the Republican governor, Henry Clay, Warner. And as this uh, case uh, becomes sensationalized, the white conservative press, many of them editors who had served in the Confederate Army, start to argue that this is a typical of the kind of crimes that are going to be committed now that the world is turned upside down and the state has been Africanized. And they are going to demand that the Reconstruction governor, Henry Clay Warren, any eight-year-old Union Army carpetbagger, as his opponents would call him, uh, do something to solve this case, but predicting all along that this newly integrated police force would be far too incompetent uh, to solve it, and that black policemen would wink at the crimes committed by African Americans in the United And it became politicized, as almost everything in the world became politicized in Reconstruction. Interactions on the sidewalk became commentaries on uh, the Reconstruction government and the effort to bring about new social relations in the South. So, they, uh, the, the women of New Orleans. Uh, who were, had been, through most of the 19th century, discouraged from engaging in uh, politics, particularly elite white women. Politics was considered the province of men. They see that this as a chance for the, to express their dissatisfaction with Reconstruction. They start marching to the home of the Dignities in a neighborhood they normally never would have gone to. They go to uh, the governor's house and are demanding that he solve a crime and hand in petitions. And uh, Henry Clay Warren takes the bait. And he says, I'm going to prove that my integrated police force is up to the task. He puts up a state reward that's going to turn this into the power ball of the summer of 1870. And he's going to have his police chief, a Massachusetts man named Algernon Sidney Badger, put his best Afro Creole detective on the case, Jean Baptiste Chauvin, a former cigar maker from the French Quarter, now detective. And as this story unfolds, leads, it goes out on the AP wire, and leads start coming in from all over the South, as far as way as Cincinnati, it makes the New York Times, and everyone who sees an African-American woman with a white child, which is everywhere in the South, thinks that they've spotted Molly Gibby. And they're now having their leads all across the Gulf Coast and sending detectives all over the place. At one point in the summer, they bring in a clairvoyant who was touring in town and thinks that she can solve the case. And uh, it's kind of a very exciting uh, story. Now, that's one uh, part of the book, kind of the who, the who done it. 
followed by a trial when they eventually find two African American women that they accuse of the crime and put them on trial. The second layer of the book is really the story of Reconstruction, which is a portion of American history that, despite really terrific effort by historians since, let's say, 1958, when Kenneth Stamp is writing, but folks like Eric Boner and others that the publishing would know, have tried to undo the old stereotypes that Reconstruction was about carpetbaggers and scalawags and corruption and this, this horrible moment foisted upon the South by the North that were, and it was great that it ended. And instead argued that many of the so-called carpetbaggers were people who truly believed they were doing uh, God's work and trying to bring a new day uh, to the American South. And uh, governments had actually achieved a lot during their brief tenure before failing. And somehow we have a national amnesia about reconstruction. Uh, if you go to Amazon now and read the early uh, 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 reviews from people who write the alleys of the book, the Vine Reader, some of them are from an older generation that were taught the carbon factor story at school. The first thing they're saying is, this isn't what we were taught in school. I didn't know any of this. And we're heading into what's essentially the 150th anniversary of Reconstruction. And I thought that the book would be a good way by using this kind of interesting story that gets you onto the ground in New Orleans and see how Reconstruction is playing out day to day to also introduce a lot of people who may not know the Reconstruction story well to the story of Reconstruction. And I'm hoping it's kind of an immersive experience of what we do. You see reconstruction on the ground and recognize that it was a moment of real possibility. That, uh, for particularly for African Americans, but also for some whites, were like, well, let's wait and see how this works out. It was not inevitable that reconstruction was going to fail. It was not inevitable that we descend into the era of Jim Crow that won't be undone until the civil rights movement. And that there was this moment that might have worked. We know it doesn't. And embedded in my story, I think, are lots of. Uh, hints at why it could have worked and why it failed. So that's the general overview. Can you talk a little bit more about Reconstruction in New Orleans and whether it was different than Reconstruction in the rest of the South or the country when it made it so unique? Well, I've always argued that if Reconstruction was going to work anywhere, the place it uh, could have worked was New Orleans. Because New Orleans was full of um, businessmen who, before the war, had voted for unionist candidates. Lincoln was on the ballot in 1860, but they voted for Stephen Douglas and uh, Stephen Douglas and John Bell. They didn't want to see the kind of drag kicking and screaming and secession. The delegates they sent to secession conventions uh, voted against secession. And then in New Orleans, you have this incredibly interesting and historically important uh, class of the Afro Creoles. These uh, African Americans, often of mixed race backgrounds, who had had freedoms uh, before the Civil War that other African Americans in the South didn't have because they were the Franco from uh, descendants of the original colonial population, who the French speaking population in New Orleans, who had intermingled, intermarried with over the years. Uh, respected, and they were merchants and doctors, and often educated their uh, children in Paris or in private schools. And having that class, both in New Orleans and in Mobile, uh, gave those two cities the ability to have uh, uh, the ability to have put people in office who put the lie to white people's claims that African Americans were too ignorant to serve uh, in political positions. And the combination of having the Afro Creoles and these commercially minded folks uh, made uh, the Reconstruction government's efforts to say, look, I'm going to rebuild the economy. I'm going to prove to you that uh, looking at the world in a new way is good for your bottom dollar. And why we have the people we're putting into office are as competent and are probably more honest than people who were in office before. Uh, and we're going to show you this can work. And it was that ever going to work anywhere. New Orleans is the place. Other questions? Uh, for a city like New Orleans that had hundreds of kidnappings every year, why did Molly Dickey stand out that particular day? Again, uh, going back to this theme, it, it, the, voodoo, this, the, the, the 
Google allegations or what additional events are on the front pages, but then it gets sucked into the political maelstrom of reconstruction. Once it becomes a political issue, just like the race incidents today that then become publicized, then it became something that everyone was reading about, and the subsequent trial transcripts will occupy the front pages of newspapers all over the South, and people will be reading about it in New York and other places. All If you're, if you're someone in, in New York following the events in the South, much like you might be reading the papers today following the events in Iraq, uh, you were hoping, often, if you're a reader of the, of the uh, New York Times or a Republican paper, you're hoping for good news out of the South, and the story of a black detective and uh, and and uh, 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 you know, things actually working, an integrated jury would have been very, very reassuring. And that's sort of how the story becomes uh, a day to day conversation all the time. Yeah, I'll look. Yeah. <laughs> um, because of the kidnapping was a symbol to both like, in media and politicians and the public, which do you think was most damaging? Like, which, which of those parties found it, you know, made. Uh, uh, it was most damaging to the Reconstruction. Yeah, I think uh, while there's plenty of evidence in my book that not everyone's mind was made up in 1870 in New Orleans, not all white people were convinced it was going to fail and that it couldn't work. But the constant drumbeat, and, and every day, newspapers were political then. They weren't trying to be unbiased, and everyone had an angle. There's only one paper supporting the Republican government, and five who were criticizing it. And their constant drumbeat on race issues, and in particular, trying to split off any whites who might align with the Republican government, uh, like Confederate General James Longstreet and others, by saying, what are you doing? How are you working with these black people? And so on and so forth. Eventually, it's going to take a heavy toll on Reconstruction. Yes? Can you talk a little more about this? I mean, cigar makers. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. While I talk about the, uh, while I mentioned the, the, uh, all of these positions that Afro had, it's a limited number of, of, of kind of vocations that Afro Creoles were with these three black people for the war allowed to participate in. Uh, many of them are craft masons and he says as a cigar maker was considered kind of a, a, a professional craft. But he is the son of John Baptiste Victor de Jordan, a white Creole gentleman. Something that enough means that he didn't have to work because they had a sugar plantation upriver and he has a townhouse in the city where he lives openly with these two mixed race women that one and then another and the first one dies. And and uh, resist what, what Americans buy uh, Louisiana, Louisiana purchase, all these Americans start flooding in and come down to see these French people living openly with their, what they'll say are the black concubines and are outraged. But the French thought it was perfectly acceptable and they're pay, they, they, they go and they, they, uh, they pay to send the kids to school. And what you have in John F.T. Shorthand is this very mannerly, very polished, very well educated, bilingual, restrained gentleman who's the perfect person to choose to be your detective because he's going to prove everywhere he goes that there are African Americans who are a lot more refined than most of the white people in New Orleans and has the education to uh, use the deductive skills that detectives were required to use in the 19th century. This is the era were detectives for the first time on police forces in the United States. And by 1870, they become the most glamorous figures in law enforcement, thanks to the short stories that we all know with the National Police Gazette. But there hadn't been any black detectives. Boston has the first detective. The gets them about 1850. But northern police forces are not integrated. New York City's not going to have a black policeman until 1911, much less a black detective. So you actually have the deep south as the as Kind of a very progressive place in 1870, and uh, as you read the book and you hear Jordan speak, you realize just in how he speaks, he, he is a, uh, a, a, it's a kind of classic 19th century manly self restraint. They were encouraged to behave like you could walk into this room and you would just have an aura of manly Are there any other compelling characters in the book? Um, 
Okay, well, Jordan, Jordan, I, I like to okay. <laughs> uh, But there, there's certainly a tech of Jordan, and uh, there's going to be a famous steamboat captain who becomes embroiled in the affair of Captain Broadwell, who had been the captain of the most famous steamboat in Mississippi that set the speed record from New Orleans to Louisville. Uh, he's going to get involved, and he's uh, compelling. And then the, the women that are accused are absolutely fascinating. They're two Afro Creole sisters who uh, have a business that runs out of Mobile in New Orleans that I don't want to give away now, but it was considered scandalous at the time. And yet, they too are these incredibly stylish, refined women that even the press that wants to demonize them is like, well, these women are really, you know, they walk into a room. Their presence is kind of a magnificent presence. And again, as you read about them, you didn't get to know them. You, you, you just feel like those are people I would really have liked to be able to meet. Incredibly interesting. I don't know uh, without giving too much away to the reveal, but their true motivations were. Uh, 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 well, here's it. Here, here, this is the heart of my uh, book, and this I'm willing to say. At the end of the book, there is enough evidence in the book for you to draw conclusions about what their true motivations were, about the fate of Molly Dickey. Uh, but I am not entirely certain in my mind which of the you know, I go in either direction. And I, but if this is not one where I wrap it up neatly for you and say, this is how it ended, and this is what happened. It's one where you're just like everyone at the time, and the guessing game continues to this very day amongst the families who remember this case. Uh, that as to what exactly happened, and I think some people will look down and say, "Oh, I know what happened," and some people will look down and make the complete opposite conclusion. Yes. Why did you want to sort of wrap that and say this is what happened and make it definitive? I think it would have been uh, intellectually fraudulent, because I don't know. I, you know, I, 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 I uh, my instinct says one thing is true, or the, the, there's so much evidence, the trial is so detailed, that you will have, to, you'll know as much as I do, and you'll walk, many of you will walk away and say, I know why they did it, and I know what it was, or I don't think they did it, and, and, and it's going to be some of the fun of the book title. Um, and, uh, and in terms of your research process, this um, you felt at the time when you discovered this, this really was something new that had to be developed into, and, uh, uh, and, and that's still, still the case. I, I'm familiar with the story, so yeah. are there um, other people explored this very It's never been written about before. Uh, one, one, uh, Woman who wrote about the, uh, the great uh, voodoo uh, queen, Marie Laveau, in one footnote mentioned that they arrested voodoo in June of 1870. But that's it, in one sentence. And no one has ever written a, a word about this case uh, in, a, in a published fashion. Uh, what turns out to be fascinating to me is that I, I, I subsequently have met some of the descendants of the various characters. One family emerged with a box in their house that their family wore about the case. The people had it and it was all kinds of things. So, from there. But what, what, one thing I might point out is my previous book was kind of a very uh, traditional uh, biography of the Supreme Court of Justice. And I was used to uh, working with materials that are very easy to find and they're all recorded and filed at the, the Library of Congress. And suddenly, I have gained uh, uh, incredible respect for family genealogists, for social historians, for anyone who's done the kind of painstaking detective work to meet on the bones of people who left a limited historical footprint. And the story is full of small characters that get uh, often I'll read a micro history, and all these names get mentioned, and they're not fleshed out because. Incredibly hard to do, and you get lost in a welter of names. And I hope I've avoided that pitfall. By if I mentioned a name, I I would say I'm going to mention a name after I've done tons and tons of digging and 
notarial archives and wills and the government court to turn that person into as full possible character as you can. And had I known how much work this was all going to take, you might I might be up here talking about Justice Roger Tawney. <laughs> was there anything shocking or surprising that you discovered during the course of your research? Yeah, I would. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can approach that on two levels. On, the, uh, uh, on one level is as you live in New Orleans or anywhere in the South uh, in after the Civil War, and I think this is probably the case in New Orleans before the Civil War, uh, and day to day life, you, you just you, you, we think we have a violent society today. You, you can't comprehend the violence uh, and the people's toleration for violence. I'll give you one instance. Uh, Detective Jordan uh, was in New Orleans in 1866. The famous New Orleans riot, where white people uh, attacked a convention of uh, African Americans and their white allies who were campaigning uh, to give African American men the right to vote. And they got attacked by the New Orleans police force. And the police force not only will kill 66 members of the convention, but then their officers told them to just go into the black neighborhood and and uh, uh, teach people a lesson. And Jordan has gone back to his to his home in the Treme uh, neighborhood, the oldest black neighborhood in the United States. And he's outside his door when he watches a policeman come down the street, tell a uh, black carpenter who was working on the house, grab the axe out of his hand and tell him to run. And then when he started running, run behind him and plant the axe into his back. And when Jordan, who knew this officer, later came up to him after the and said, why do you do that? And I was just following orders. And if, if there's a level of violence in the Civil War era that uh, it's hard to comprehend. Uh, and then lots of uh, shocking things happened to my characters later in life. But I don't want to give those away. But there's a couple when you get to the final chapter uh, where you're just like, oh, yeah. I guess the, the last question I have is, how do you discover the story? What made you want to write it? Again, when you're reading every day of a new, I was looking for this. This is your high school class, so you know what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was writing about how uh, how a lawyer in New Orleans reads and the courts obstruct the structure, and I was looking for references to the famous slaughterhouse case. At the time, you just heard of the slaughterhouse case. I was looking for references to the slaughterhouse cases in every single day of every paper. And when you're doing that, you become a, like it's like you're having your morning coffee in 1870, and suddenly when you see voodoo sac, when you see baby abducted for voodoo sacrifice, you start following that story. And as a follower, you're like, how oh, this is good. Ooh, this is really good. Oh, wait a minute, it's a clinical implication. Oh, wait a minute, if, if this turns into a trial, I'm going to write about it, and then. In August of 1870, it's 11 days of trial transcripts all over the newspapers on the that's it. Yeah, um, you mentioned that speculation about voodoo really being in the Were there other cases prior to this one that had focused on voodoo or had somehow set up precedent that sort of no, there's lots of it, 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 what, what's entertaining about reading court records in New Orleans is there are lots of voodoo cases, and it's often someone suing a voodoo practitioner for leaving a, a great reed altar on their steps. You know, like a, I described it in the book here. One set of them think they're going to do chickens, and there's all, but it mentions curses, and people, you know, say, I got ill, and there's all kinds of litigation over voodoo in New Orleans. Buddha, I, mean, I don't want to make uh, Buddha sound too exotic and, and crazy, but the practitioners of Buddha saw themselves as practicing Roman Catholics, a syncretic Caribbean Catholic religion. And until the Americans arrived, uh, the priests at St. Louis Cathedral, which is the Grand Cathedral in New Orleans, allowed them to set up Buddha altars in, because they saw them as you know, shepherding to the, to the people of New Orleans and letting them have some freedom to have their money to worship. But nevertheless, both uh, African Americans and whites in New Orleans uh, believed that the voodoo practitioners could issue curses, could affect elections, could heal people. 
you have this, you have the elite white women who poo poo voodoo, and then when somebody gets sick, it's sneaking to a voodoo practitioner's house in the French Quarter for herbs or and the like. So there's a lot of it, but this is the first which I saw entangled in reconstruction. Did you, did you see it affecting the afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know a lot about what happens with reconstruction, but I would have to really keep thinking past 1870. Searching for other other cases, and uh, maybe we could collaborate on things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you talk a little bit about what the slides to research this case and the book um, as somebody who was living in teaching in New Orleans, and then uh, finish the book with somewhere else? Um, uh, well, first, uh, let me mention I had a uh, part of this book a very experience. Uh, and that is, uh, I found this case uh, when my uh, wife and I were living in uptown New Orleans in the Bell Castle uh, Camp Street. And as I dug into the case more and more, I later discovered in my, uh, with my jaw dropping that the woman from New Orleans who was accused of the crime lived on the exact spot where I was living. Her house had been torn down and a new house built in 1920, but I was on the exact Spot. And uh, you know, I'm not a question of the supernatural, but that was a spooky of all the places in New Orleans. And I thought at the time I was the only person that ever knew anything about this story. And there I am looking out the window, because the houses across the street were there in 1970. And looking out my window at the houses that this accused woman looked at, and uh, I started drinking heavily. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the question of finishing it somewhere else. Uh, my wife and I moved from New Orleans. And if you move from New Orleans these days, all your friends call you a quitter. And Berkeley we got them fancy jobs in their own fancy job. Uh, and I have to admit, uh, I love Maryland to death, but no place uh, is more inspiring to a writer, particularly if you're writing about a New Orleans than New Orleans. New Orleans is a city where the sidewalks speak to you, history, every block you're on, you just feel the way of history, and it's nothing easier to give uh, the mood to write about the past than living in a place that just the past is oozing everywhere. And the DC suburbs, the, you know, the past is not talking to you from the sidewalks. Uh, so if, if, you know, trickier at the end to get that same level of immersion. All right, cool, thank you.